So uh, hello everyone who's uh, watching this. My name is uh, Bruce Wenzel. I am a, a graduate student in the Department of Sociology at MSU Mankato here in the United States. Um, I'm also the president and co-founder of the Neurodiversity Activists, which is a student-led organization on campus. Um, for me, the uh, connection between sociology and neurodiversity activism is very much uh, clear to me, especially in uh, C. Wright Mills's book, uh, The Sociological Imagination, where he um, advocates, uh, he basically says that the central component of sociology is being able to uh, acquire new perspectives to shift from one viewpoint to another. And of course, the neurodiversity movement is, uh, to quote the queer autistic scholar Nick Walker, uh, basically the social justice movement to shift from the pathology paradigm, which assumes that there is one normal neurology, uh, to the uh, neurodiversity paradigm, which says that uh, neurological diversity is um, a natural form of human diversity subject to the same societal dynamics as other forms of diversity. And um, over, the, over the last couple of years here, basically for my, um, since the beginning basically of my grad school uh, experience to now I'm entering my third year, I've basically, uh, about a year and a half ago, I re-examined my, basically my whole life through the lens of the neurodiversity paradigm and saw these um, social dynamics that manifest in other marginalized groups also manifest in the autistic community and various other uh, neuro minority communities. And um, the result of that was that I had coined uh, several new terms, at least to my knowledge, I looked all over the place to see if someone else had come up with similar things. And um, I, to my knowledge, I had independently coined uh, the term uh, neuralism, which is basically the neurodiversity equivalent of, uh, you know, racism. It's, uh, it's discrimination based on neurology. And then from there, I uh, coined things like uh, institutional uh, neuralism, which is the neurodiversity equivalent of institutional racism, and then uh, neurological battle fatigue, which is the neurodiversity equivalent of uh, racial battle fatigue. And so, and there are several other uh, terms that I had uh, discovered through re-examining my life through the, the lens of the neurodiversity paradigm, but for the purposes of this discussion, what's uh, you know, fitting with the theme of banning teaching ABA. Um, the fact that ABA applied behavior analysis and its various derivatives like PBIS and social skills training and so on and so forth. The fact that those are part of the formal curriculum at MSU is a component of institutional discrimination against neuro minorities, the fact that it's part of the curriculum. Um, so say for example, in the psychology department, there are um, applied behavior analysis classes, obviously psychology in general, even if there weren't ABA classes is based in the pathology paradigm. It says autism and various other neurocognitive styles are mental disorders, there, there are these deficits, there are these disabilities, there are these things that are something wrong with you versus uh, I, I think um, the social critic Henry Duro who co-founded Critical Pedagogy with Paulo Fieri. Um, you know, he, he talked about the educational deficit in America. And I think these so-called deficits of autistic people is just a consequence of our education deficit, namely that it sucks. <laughs> like it doesn't, um, our university's motto, MSU's motto is big ideas, real world thinking but its curriculums as they are currently constructed do not reflect the really existing diversity of human brains and embodied minds. And so um, with that, and then of course you have the, uh, the special ed pro program, which should not uh, even be a, a program as I was telling Jorn and Marie in uh, previous discussions, uh, special education is just segregation because what ultimately happens is you pathologize 
uh, neuro minorities, neurodivergent students, you then separate them from their neurotypical peers. And if any, if we learned anything from the black civil rights movement in the sixties, it's that there's no such thing as separate but equal. And then when you separate them, their uh, these services that they're given are behaviorist interventions. They're things like ABA and all those other things. So basically what special ed does is pathologize them, say you have a mental disorder, separate them, and then put them through a modern version of conversion therapy. And um, of course, it's not just psychology and special ed programs that are, you know, the obvious ones that we've been dealing with for decades, but also just in general, like the, 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 uh, the gen ed curriculum. I mean, I can recall when I was an undergrad here at MSU, the, uh, I had a 100 level biology lecture and, you know, one of the presentations was very based in the pathology paradigm and said, you know, autism is, is a disorder, this, 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 this. And um, uh, so since April, uh, well, back in April during uh, Autism Acceptance Month, we had uh, Nick Walker herself come visit us over Zoom and wrote a uh, letter to the editor of the uh, school paper, the MSU Reporter. Uh, advocating for them to get rid of ABA, saying, you know, this is conversion therapy. It inspired queer conversion therapy in the 60s and the 70s. And I said, uh, you know, the higher level admins still have time to save their legacies and, um, you know, do right by the autistic community and get rid of this so that they're no longer complicit in, you know, what uh, um, various uh, neurodiversity scholars have called the autism industrial complex, the war on autism, those sorts of things. Um, and then I met with politicians, made a move on petition to ban ABA in Minnesota and all these other things. So I basically spent the last half year um, advocating for neurodivergent liberation, particularly getting rid of ABA. And um, I met with student government recently and spoke to them about it on uh, last Wednesday, in fact. And then less than 48 hours later, the College of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences appointed the former chair of the psychology program, who's a pro ABA faculty member as the interim associate dean. So the exact opposite of what we've, our members have been advocating for over the last year, uh, it, Needless to say, we were very upset about that. So that's further galvanized uh, my own efforts in terms of um, getting into student government, um, having these panels, um, and um, you know, saying basically the um, the the gist of uh, my argument here to wrap up would be to say that um, uh, firstly. Uh, I believe that um, one's neurocognitive style should, like one's gender identity, sexual or romantic orientation, it should be discovered, not diagnosed. And also, um, I think the university should stop at, at teaching people to attempt to convert uh, neurodivergent people into neurotypical people. And we, the campus community, should focus on converting this neuronormative institution into a neurocosmopolitan one where there is no such thing as a normal mind just as there's no such thing as a normal ethnicity or sexuality or gender or culture or whatever um so it's a more democratic institution that promotes diversity and the uh their actions and their words match basically um i think that's uh, a good um Summary, other than that, oh, I would say one last thing is in Mankato, uh, Minnesota, um, we're famous for having the largest mass execution in US history, the hanging of 38 Dakota men back in the US war era. And um, so I, I really pushed the, what uh, the indigenous autistic scholar, Jules Edwards wrote uh, a while back, where she said that applied behavior analysis, ABA, is forced assimilation reminiscent of the boarding school era for the indigenous people where they would attempt to convert indigenous youth into white Christian youth.
So that's me. Um, that's why I'm here. Thank you to everyone who came here. Um, Jorn, I'll pass it off to you to transition to whoever's next. Many thanks, Bruce, for this introduction. And I think, Tanya, this uh, provides you with some context. And I'm looking forward to a really interesting discussion here because I think we can all relate to the these challenges that Bruce, Bruce uh, alluded to that in previous eras and even today are faced by indigenous communities, right? And so from your South African perspective, I'm sure you can comment on that as an autistic person. And similarly here, I'll be able to comment from a, from a, a, a perspective here in Aotearoa with uh, our Maori communities and the intersectionality with neurodiversity. Uh, and in my case, given my professional sort of focus also uh, that additional intersection with healthcare professionals and the toxic culture in healthcare in general. So there's very interesting intersections that we can talk about. And so I'm now looking forward. Tanya, please feel free to introduce yourself, where you're coming from, um, what your um, relation is to um, autistic ways of being and uh, what's all the work that you've been doing and your latest observations on this topic in particular and your thoughts, because it's a new topic that deserves really deep and a lot of attention going forward. Thank you, Jan. And I also appreciate the amount of time that you've given us this time to expound on things. It's going to the depth um, that Bruce has gone into. I, I think I would like to match because of the angle that I'm coming from, it will give a lot of context to the way that I see the way forward. So first of all, I'm uh, approaching my 60s. I'm an autistic woman diagnosed as many of us are in our you know, 40s when I was perimenopausal. Um, I've been in activism since about 2009. And um, for the last approximately seven years, I've had two specific focus areas in activism, namely health and the rights of non-speaking autistic people. Now, ABA has intersected a lot with that because they're the ones most likely to be dumped into the, if, as you know, if, if you kind of passed as normal but quirky until you finally broke down completely as I did, you would not necessarily have ended up in ABA. Um, having said that as well, I also need to contextualize the South African environment. We are a very divided company country in terms of the, the, the biggest disparities between rich and poor in the world, as far as I know, in South Africa, in fact, is in a town about 50 kilometers from where I am right now. Um, so some people get like no services. If you even get a, an autism diagnosis, there's no place that you get to go to, and you're very lucky if you can make it into a special needs school. The special needs school that you might end up in, though, is not necessarily going to be doing ABA. Here and there, you might find some ABA-based stuff. They are going to underestimate you, certainly, um, especially if you don't speak. And they're going to be treating you in a baby-like way, but they're not going to be doing that. They're just going to not expect you. They're going to expect that you are mentally disabled in a big way, you know, that kind of stuff. If you have wealthy parents, well, then you could get into uh, 40 hours a week kind of, or kind of ABA, the same that you have in the USA. And um, at an enormous price, if you have the so-called the bears. But otherwise, there are also things in between. So there are many schools which call themselves ABA-based, for example. Now, we in Africa, now so I'm zooming out to the continent for a moment, have not had an equivalent of the BACB, for example, some other accreditation body. So the people who have been accredited in ABA in Africa have been accredited somewhere else. They have been to CARD, they have traveled to the UK, they have trained in America and so on. And so that they're not that many, but many people therefore call themselves ABA based because they can't sometimes claim that they're fully doing ABA because they don't have the, you know, they know that there's licensing associated with it. Now we had a horrible kind of setback in Africa. Uh, was it now last year? My, the time since 1919, uh, 2019, you know, years just kind of fly into each other. But we'd had an organization which was kind of parent charity led that established themselves 
uh, called the Pan-African Congress on Autism, and they were very pro-ABA. That was pretty much, they wanted to hold the conference. That was one of the big things that they wanted to do, and it was going to be an all-ABA conference. And some people objected. They tried to get autistic voices in. We were kind of like, we tried to get them with the, the best world activists who were intersectional in terms of, for example, being black woman, mother, autistic herself, mother of autistic children, you know, please speak to, you know, African uh, parents, please just speak to these guys to talk some sense and they wouldn't listen. They went ahead, collaborated with ABAI, which I will contextualize what that is in a moment, and then finally established the, the PAABA, which is an accreditation organization for ABA in Africa. And yeah, but and when they launched, they would not hear from any autistic people, blocked us on social media, we're not allowed to say anything. No consultation, no anything, just we're gonna take over Africa with ABA now. So that I'm, I'm gonna get back to that if I have a chance uh, to link to how that happened, why that happened, what happened in America to make it happen. Um, but then, uh, before I get there, I just want to give some context of my own experience and where I come into this. As an activist for the rights of non-speaking autistic people, many with many of them, and especially if they had wealthier parents in the U, not just in the USA, but in South Africa as well, the wealthier ones would have ended up in, in ABA, many of them. So that means that many of my fellow activists who are non-speaking in South Africa have experienced ABA. And I was, this one was amusing. I was recently privy to the conversation, the transcript of a conversation, which, what was it, two of them or three of them, I think it was, had, where they got together socially and um, they communicate quite slowly. They've got to point to letters and things like that. Um, but they were so scathing of the ABA that they've been through. And it was, and even the religious ones were like the whole thing was just laced with profanity that you kind of have to laugh at how they and they were it was past now you know their parents had kind of seen the light their parents are like yeah sorry and I made a bad mistake putting my kid into this um, but this is pervasively with just a few exceptions um, what non-speakers are saying about ABA throughout the world. Uh, or the ones who actually eventually do get access to some form of AAC where they can fully express their opinions. And, and I did want to say with a few exceptions, and usually when there are exceptions, the exceptions are as follows. They are like my behavior tech went off script and no longer was doing ABA because they saw that it wasn't working and they really started looking for solutions for me. So I will forever be grateful to my behavior tech. In other words, it's an ABA person who is praised by an autistic person for not doing ABA. So that's, that's the one version. Um, there are a few of those, but they're, they're not many, but they but they are. You know, I can actually name who, who said things like that. Then the second one is that there's... Just trying to think now. Yeah, because I'm just trying to focus on non-speakers for a moment. There's only one particular non-speaker that I know of at the moment who espouses ABA and then in a very specific context. In other words, you have to first be able to communicate really well. If you can't do that, you can't tell the, um, the BCBA or whoever's leading your, your ABA, you can't tell them your goals. And this person's actually written a couple of things on his blog, in fact, as well talking about things which are actually abusive, which I don't think he realizes. For example, he was really angry that they changed the reward system without agreement with him and now start to prohibit him from going to the toilet whenever he wants to. And he actually has a problem with incontinence. So he needs to, when he needs to go, he's got to go. Otherwise he's going to wet himself, you know? So, <laughs> but he's still thinking that ABA is like, well, you know, they're trying to help me. So even in that situation where, well, clearly that's not okay. I mean, you don't go to your psychologist and then you say to the psychologist, excuse me, I need to go to the toilet. And they say, no, that's not on. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tanya, I'm just thinking, maybe we yeah. should alert the, the broader audience uh, around some of the perverse context that sits around ABA. You sort of uh, mentioned it very briefly, but I'm not sure whether the uh, general audience sort of uh, gets the, the nuance here. The thing with ABA is that, and, and not only ABA, I mean, this is 
I would like to criticize all behaviorist approaches that uh, are based on um, social power gradients um, and uh, forced obedience, whatever level of sugar coating exists around us. The details of the technique actually don't matter. What matters here is the question, who is setting the goals? And in ABA and all these related behaviors approaches, it's never, uh, or it's only to a very limited extent, does the person at the receiving end have any ability to influence the goal, right? Whereas if it were truly any kind of technique that is genuinely conceived to help the person at the receiving end, that person would be setting all the goals. And in the case of, uh, and then you can ask in the case of young children, well, who is even able to give consent to this type of thing, right? Um, and so we've got very, very fundamental issues that are actually completely detached as to how you sugarcoat brand and market this thing. Sorry, yes, you can continue. And that is one of the biggest problems with ABA. It is the, the question of assent and consent. Recently, Anne Mehmet posted uh, a study on which has just come out now. You know, there's so much talk about this new ABA, supposedly, but when we, it, like, what is new ABA? Does that mean like post 1920, uh, 19, why am I going back into the 20th century all, all the time? Um, it's, it's, is that like post 2019? Because stuff which has come out after 2019 is no better than some of the things which was coming out 20, 30 years ago. So, I mean, like children who did not give a cent, who, who um, cry, who try to run away from what's being done to them. And this is seen to be a problem behavior. You know, when, when somebody is clearly unhappy by having horrible stuff done to them, so that, you know, there's no way of escape. There's no way of, of taking a look at, but the assent has been withdrawn. This child doesn't have any way of saying, I withdraw my assent because they perhaps cannot speak. You know, they're going to express it in some other way. They're going to scream. They're going to lash out. So, yeah, so that kind of stuff is still happening in research. It, it's not any good. And this particular guy, you know, that now I'm zooming in onto the exception to the rule, but in this exception to the rule, um, the you know, which is a non-speaking guy who said ABA is cool. Um, even there, the, the, the matter of, it was his goals in the beginning. It was, there was agreement about what was going to be done in reinforcement. There was agreement that was going to be done in all of these things on how it would be done. And then, the person working with him just changed. And his mother had worked so hard to try to find the right kind of person to him who could work to his goals because they're so unaccustomed to actually working to the goals of the client. Sorry, a, a goals of the person that they're working with because client could have two definitions. They're working with you know, either their own goals or the goal of the parent or something like that. So somebody was prepared to take the goals from him and yet this person still goes and changes the thing like suddenly you're not allowed to go to the toilet. So they, they're just not accustomed to working with people who, who must give consent. So yeah, okay, so that's the one aspect, working with non-speakers, but that also brings me to the word neurodiversity and how, and I wanna get back to conversion therapy as well in terms of how that is usually brought up in defense of ABA. Let me just go to conversion therapy while I'm still there. So, uh, you know, if you say that ABA is conversion therapy, there, there are a lot of ABA proponents who are going to argue with you because they're going to say that ABAI, which is the, they've changed their name. It used to be the Association for Behavior Analysis International, and I think it's now ABA International or something like that. But anyway, so ABAI, they um, have a position statement on conversion therapy for gay people and for trans people, and they say that that's not okay in their position statement. And in fact, ABA people were among the first people to put out a position statement against conversion therapy for gay people. So they kind of pride themselves in that. And that's why they don't like it when you tell them that, well, actually ABA as it's done to autistic people is conversion therapy as well. Because if you look at what it does, then you know that kind of happens. Unless you get some of the people who call themselves modern who say, but we don't, yeah, this is a funny thing. We don't we don't punish anyone for stimming. We don't do anything. We only reward them if they don't do it. 
<laughs> not like, if they happen to not do it, it just comes down to the same thing as I'm talking because of the behavioral thing. Right, so that's that's the one thing. Um, sorry, there was going to be two. Uh, the one was on conversion therapy. Yes, neurodiversity, I want to get back to that. The other thing I just, I'll get back to neurodiversity. The other thing I just want to talk about is what ABA really is, because we, you know, we've had a lot of panels where we haven't talked about what that is. ABA is two things actually really in terms of how the, the term is used. The one thing is it's an academic discipline, you know, like you can study psychology or whatever, except for I would kind of call it a pseudoscience, which I could go into maybe even in another panel as to why I say that. It will actually feature tonight as well, or today, depending on when you listen to this. Um, the other thing that it is, is it's a term that is used for intensive behavior therapy based on the belief system of ABA. So that therapy should actually have a different name and it doesn't. It usually just gets called ABA. In other words, like you go in for, for a session with um, a, a psychologist and the, the psychologist doesn't say, I'm going to do psychology on you now. You know, if the word is not used in that way. Psychology is the overall discipline. We're going to have counseling or I'm going to be doing psychotherapy just got a different word. So ABA doesn't have a separate word for that concept. ABA as a science or pseudoscience, depending on who applies it really, I suppose, also applies to animal training. It applies to a whole lot of things not to do with autistic people. So when we take a look at it from a ban ABA perspective, it's really not something that I believe that we need to spend all our energy on in trying to get banned for its use in sport, for example. If the sports guys feel that this is not beneficial to them, especially if you're dealing with younger children, then let them do that. There are definitely issues with how it's used in sport, but maybe there's some, some ways because people are used to doing repetitive things that it becomes a kind of coaching. And then you'll get people who argue, but how is that different from traditional coaching? But you know, traditional coaches are not, perhaps not so, so good in the task breakdown and in the reinforcement. You know? So that we can kind of set aside and we can, we can go and get philosophical about that. Our issue is the way in which this therapy, which doesn't have a separate name, unless it's applied to young children, in which case it will be called EIBI. Uh, so it's uh, e e B early intensive behavioral intervention whether that abbreviates to. So yes, so that is the difference. And that's the one we, we want to focus on in terms of banning. Now, having put all this, now we've got a couple of def definitions there. I want to get back to where neurodiversity as a concept fits into this. You will find these days a lot of ABA um, defenders and promoters and so on arguing and getting themselves into all sorts of red herrings and straw man arguments around the concept of neurodiversity. And they will, and they do this, I kind of feel, I've had it done to me recently, where some, some people running an ABA company I never mentioned the word neurodiversity once, and they keep throwing into the argument, but neurodiversity activists say that, that it's just a difference, and, you, and you're like the X-Men, you've just got a difference, and you know, actually all superheroes with your own special talent, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I wasn't even going there, but they're the ones who came up with neurodiversity. Now, <laughs> I'm happy to, con to look at Autism from a very neutral perspective, there might be some things in us that are actually exceptionally broken <laughs> and some things that work really well. It's a phenomenon. I'm not going to go and classify it as either good or bad because if I do that, even as I don't care really whether this is a natural variation or an unnatural variation, it does not make any difference to my stance on ABA whether somebody even sees their autism as being broken, whether they see it as a gift, whichever of those, those things they take. Because there's one central thing that we can agree with, no matter where we come from, in terms of the neurodiversity movement, one aspect of it. Essentially, it is a disability rights movement. That's one of the things that's at the core of the neurodiversity movement. So even if you say, I don't like my autism, and I would actually prefer to not be autistic. And I don't like all the deficits that come with it. Even if you say that, your rights as a disabled person still need to be respected. And the neurodiversity movement, at least the people who are mature in it, 
we're going to say you have as much a right as anybody else to a fair treatment in terms of what you feel you need. And you will find people, I mean, I have a friend who really doesn't like being autistic at all. And she has multiple disabilities, which intermingle with her autism to such an extent that you can't easily classify which part is the autism, which part is the brain damage, which part is the, you know, all these different things. Whatever it is, she doesn't like being in the state that she's in. However, she hates ABA. So you can see now that if somebody, even if somebody does consider themselves to have a disorder and not just a disability, they still might not feel that ABA is the thing that's actually going to work for them. And that's why we do not always have to link an, the anti-ABA movement to the neurodiversity movement. Yes, I mean, like, I don't know anybody within the neurodiversity movement, really, other than people who co-opt the term who are going to be for ABA. But you will also get people who describe themselves as, and they will use for themselves words like severe autism, the non-speaking people, a few of them use that, not all of them. Um, they will use words such as, yeah, I, I have a disorder. They will, they will use this terminology. At the same time, they are exceptionally scathing of ABA. So when we take a look at it from a disability rights perspective, and for, for now I'm going to just pause it there so that I can just at least hand over to, to the rest of you and then give you a glimpse of what else I've brought to, to talk about. But when we take a look at a disability rights perspective and we say neurodiversity can be a great way for us to um, express that our thinking is different and that that has to be respected. Um, but not necessarily everything about our body or our movements. And many non-speaking people have severe apraxia or ataxia or a bunch of other movement issues, which they re themselves regard as a big problem. And they like, gee, if that could be fixed, you know, I'd be happy. And for them, that's also part of their autism because that's how they feel that autism expresses itself. It's a, it's a sensory movement mixture of things, which we who speak with comfort and maybe who moves just slightly clumsily like I do, don't necessarily have such a big obstacle. With. So yeah, so that then as a background brings us to, if this is a disability rights thing, that means the same as if your disability was you fell off, um, uh, you had a diving accident, you knocked your head on a rock and you're now quadriplegic you still have dis rights as a disabled person that clearly is damage okay but you're still going to say i don't agree that what you're doing to my spine is what i want done because this tends to damage me please don't try to make me walk again it's causing more harm than good rather just support me the way that i am same thing if you're autistic you're saying the same thing as don't fiddle with me work with me the way that my body works now or, you know, for my, in this case, for my whole life. And, and that will then bring us to linking to today's subject, which is the, you know, should we be teaching ABA? If we're going to be teaching the philosophies of the evil men of the past, let's say Mein Kampf, Hitler's book, and we want to teach that in political science, there's no real reason why we shouldn't do that it could be good to look at the original source of that but how are you teaching it are you teaching that to people as a historical and understanding hi i see karen has just joined us um my friend from kenya um are we teaching it in that context or are we teaching it as people like this is the way that you should go about the world and this is the thing that must inform all of our governments and our our civil you know our public service is mein cup no, we should probably not be treating, <laughs> you know, that piece of historical literature in that way. And similarly, so we could go ahead and we could teach ABA in, uh, in universities. We could look at it from a critical perspective. But it has to be taken a look at it then from a critical perspective, because currently it actually isn't taught that way. It's taught with the intention that you're going to use this and use it on people. And once I've given a chance to my, you know, the other panelists to have a word, I'd like to go on talking about how the major bodies that set the standards for ABA education, especially in the US, but also influencing other countries. In other words, what is taught at university? The ones who say that it has to comply to the following standards, for example, how those people are actively involved in supporting torture, 
those same people who set the standards for what ABA should comply to in universities, those people are involved in the worst forms of ABA, which you can get in the world today. Over to you. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Tanya, for uh, your contribution here. Um, I, and, and thank you for bringing up this topic of disability. I think we should briefly mention the social model of disability for everyone to understand what we're talking about. The social model of disability is basically saying that, well, if you're disabled, it's not necessarily that something wrong with you, but it's society that is disabling you. It's the norms um, and expectations of society that lead to you being disabled in a society. Now, um, and this is where I would like to chip in here and to say, um, well, we actually need to, this brings, brings us to cultural bias um, because, and again, I'll broaden the sphere here. Um, we need, and I think at the in earlier parts of this discussion with Bruce and Marie, um, we also touched on this. It's this entire discipline, disciplinary thinking in our universities and the social sciences, in disciplines such as psychology, psychiatry, um, and even beyond, um, you know, we've got disciplines like economics, um, business schools, what they teach there. These are all disciplines, um, silos of so-called knowledge that have arisen out of uh, the industrial era. This is a product of Western European culture. So uh, we need to be clear that um, there is no such thing as um, a culturally neutral discipline of psychology. And um, since, yeah, and psychiatry, uh, well, then of course extends into medicine. But if you look at uh, how the diagnostic and statistical manual operates, uh, that this is uh, groups of uh, established uh, people in the medical world getting together, deciding on what's normal and not normal, and then coming up with labels. Um, this is, if I've ever seen cultural bias, that's cultural bias. And now, as humans, we all have our neurological predispositions and ways of perceiving and, and learning and um, moving. And these ways can be different. The extent to which our particular autistic ways of being are being supported, celebrated, or pathologized, despised, depends on the culture in which we find ourselves in. Um, and in and I um, tend to and in order to understand this cultural bias, um, I'm I've moved over the years away from using the term neurotypical. I pr much prefer to use the term neuronormative because neuronormativity is something that you can understand within the context of a specific culture. And as soon as you realize that there are different cultures, you'll understand that neuronormativity is different. It varies from culture to culture. Um, and um, therefore, if you then look at the um, definitions of these so-called um, mental disorders and developmental disorders in the DSM, um, well, they are steeped in the Western um, concept of neuronormativity. And therefore, these concepts, you can't just uproot them and deploy them in other cultures. So the discussion around the, the DSM and the particular labels we find there is actually a discussion that's limited to the, the, the Western world, really. Um, because there those labels were conceived. And so you can understand the DSM as being, yeah, the ultimate product of Western neuronormativity and uh, neocolonialism, imperialism. Um, and we, I think, uh, and this context is needed to understand 
the pro the level of um, violence and uh, power dynamics that is exerted via techniques such as ABA, which are then um, endorsed um, by um, medical professions in psychiatry, for example, who have real positions of power in the medical establishment. Um, and uh, well, from there you can then see how this then integrates into the uh, what's now known as the autism industrial complex. So, and be, and of course, teaching is only one aspect of academia, right? The other important aspect in academia is research. And now we're getting to the crux of it, right? Entire disciplines like psychology, psychiatry, and so forth, um, they are not only teaching, they're also conducting research. So, uh, and then we have, so one question that I think in this panel we should explore is how um, do we intend to ensure that research in these silos of psychology, psychiatry, and so forth going forward is going to be free from this industrialized neuronormative cultural bias? Can we actually do this within those silos? Or do we need to say, well, those silos are so broken, we need to come up with a new discipline or with a new well, anti-disciplinary approach uh, that allows us to conduct a research that frees us from this uh, Western neuronormative uh, bias that has crept into many of these social sciences. I mean, um, if you want to span it really bro broadly, I mean, the entire so-called science of economics is steeped in behaviorism, right? Um, so um, it's no surprise uh, why autistic people tend to be uh, very uncomfortable with the entire economic uh, so-called uh, system that we are supposed to operate under. And um, yeah, Bruce, do you maybe want to comment there from your uh, background in uh, sociology? And now we can... I think we should uh, give um, Karen Moriyuki from Kenya a chance to introduce herself. Sure. Um, from a sociological perspective, I mean, one of the things, uh, again, we talk about those social patterns, those fundamental patterns playing out amongst uh, all marginalized communities. Um, as I told Jorn and uh, Marie uh, uh, in our previous session, for example, um, like uh, minority groups have been pathologized to justify social hierarchies under capitalism for as long as capitalism has been around. And uh, for example, the uh, Marxist scholar Oliver Cromwell Cox uh, wrote this article that I read in Sociological Theory where he basically, he looked at um, comparing slave societies in ancient Roman, ancient Greece to like contemporary modern society. And he found that, yeah, there were masters and slaves, but there was no racism because it wasn't discrimination based on skin color. And so he had said, he had shown how racism was a product of capitalism, which was then echoed, of course, by Malcolm X in the 60s, when he said that you can't have capitalism without racism. Um, and of course, you know, queer communities have been pathologized as having mental disorders because they diverged from heteronormativity. And um, similarly with uh, uh, autistic uh, and otherwise neurodivergent people with neurominorities, I had found in my own uh, research, reading your own stuff, other, you know, Marxist uh, writings and sort of my own lived experience and like wedding all of those things, I had found that uh, neuralism, the term I had coined for neurological discrimination that did not exist um, prior to like if you were to go back to prehistoric tribes they actually valued um, for example our so-called impairments or disabilities like when we say when say for example an autistic uh, a kid or even just my own experience I can recall from about a uh, two years ago now where I was uh, sitting in the basement of the CSU on campus the student union and I was sitting in the fireplace by the front entrance and um, I heard this, you know, dr loud droning hum like this rattling and it took me a minute to realize that I was hearing the vending machine on the other, the, the 
total opposite side of the building, which is, you know, it's a decent walk to get to the other side. And um, so, so the pathologists, they'll come in and they'll say, you have sensory impairments because you can't tolerate these things. When in fact, new research that's based more on the neurodiversity paradigm has been validating what the autistic community has been saying all along, which is, it's not that we can't tolerate what everybody else is tolerating. It's that we can in fact take in, we have a wider auditory perception. So these impairments, I flipped that narrative and in, in conversations I've had with Nick Walker about this too, is like, from my perspective, I don't have the sensory impairment, the, the neuromajority, majority, the neuronormative people, neurotypicals, whatever you want to call them. Um, they're the ones who can't hear what I can hear. And in hunter gatherer cultures, you know, and tribes prior to capitalism or even feudalism, you know, who do you think were the members of the tribe who alerted the other members of approaching danger or a predator lurking in the bushes? The first one who heard it. So in that context, we were not seen as broken. In this context, when we're saying the 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 cheap um, the capitalism is always trying to look for the cheapest thing possible to maximize profits that then when you have a group of people who can pick up on the flaws of those systems yeah they're going to complain about it and, but then what happens is instead of saying oh thanks for the critique we value your input it's no there's something wrong with you go to accessibility resources and it's like no. And in regards to ABA, um, to because I noticed a couple of people came in here late after we gave a little intro, just to give everyone sort of a short history of ABA and why I'm so, you know, there's the hashtag ban ABA, all ABA, is because ABA was created by uh, Dr. Uh, Ovi Varlovas in UCLA, who was a psychologist who was inspired by the behaviorist work of B.F. Skinner, who did things on pigeons. And he invented ABA in an attempt to turn autistic kids into neurotypical kids and our normative kids. And um, about 11 years later, and that was in 1961, and 11 years later in 1972, he applied those same techniques when he and his uh, autistophobic colleagues co-founded the Feminine Boy Project, which was the genesis for gay conversion therapy. And so what I tell uh, qu other queer activists, because I'm on the uh, Pride Fest organizing committee, is that conversion therapy for LGBTQIA plus people is just ABA imposed on gender, sexual, and romantic minorities. And conversion therapy for autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people is just ABA applied to neural minorities. So when we talk about banning conversion therapy and the ABA proponents saying, well, it's really not this, it's something different, it's how you apply it and so on and so forth. That's just the smoke screen that they put out there to be like, well, we don't give kids electric shocks anymore. Well, congratulations, you sh never should have in the first place. The, the fact that you're even attempting to change their behavior to convert them into something that they're not is the problem. And unfortunately, just as in the 60s, you had a bunch of, uh, for example, gay people have internalized homophobia from their pathologization, and they genuinely thought there was something wrong with them, like, oh, I have a disorder, disability, whatever. You have a bunch of autistic people today who have that internalized autistophobia, that internalized depression, who think, yes, I need these things, I need this treatment, and da 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 da. And they don't pick up on those social patterns of special education being segregation because it separates them from the majority and all these other things. And of course, there are entire industries that profit off of that. So the economic system is very much at the source of why these things continue. Look no further than the, aut the autistophobic hate group Autism Speaks, which lobbies governments to mandate medical assistance coverage for ABA, which was something that, I mean, not even Senator Nick Frentz was really aware of. I had to read the bill from 2014 myself. It was a 700 page thing. 
read it in a night and told him, here's where the problem is. So uh, that's sort of my long winded answer to the question. I think it's really important that people understand the context of where this comes from, what it really is, and the rhetorical smoke screens that people put up there. Yeah, thank you. And I'm wondering, um, Karen Moriyuki uh, from Kenya, I think uh, one of our panelists is in the call um, or in the, are you able to introduce yourself? And I would like to give you the floor. Uh, so we've been going on here for nearly an hour. So we need to give you adequate time here. And then we've got, um, I think, um, uh, Alex yeah. Constein from uh, Canada as well, but uh, yeah, Karen, uh, we're really looking forward to hearing your, your perspective on um, autistic people in Kenya and what your thoughts mm. are in terms of um, how urgent is it to ban the teaching of ABA and um, how can this uh, be uh, put, how, how can we, yeah, how does this affect the situation in Kenya on the ground? What's the potential there and where are the dangers? Yeah. Hi guys, sorry I woke up right now, but I am, I'm Karen Moriyuki. I'm from Kenya. I'm a bridge um, uh, alumni. I'm an Ida bridge alumni. I have been studying a lot about the CRPD. Uh, what I can pretty say about uh, in regards about ABA it is really alive and kicking in Kenya. Uh, I have spoken out against it so many times. There's been training programs on ABA, uh, parent training programs where they're taught about ABA. And that is that's a big concern that I usually, I have, and it's a total violation of Article 15 and 16 of the CRPD. And uh, as I speak right now, um, there was a bill that was passed, I think a long time ago when the MCAs in the Nairobi County had, had introduced um, an autism bill. And that also had some provincials, uh, some ABA pro provincials. And I was like, oh no, this is not happening. It seems that that autism bill was passed, but it was really uh, something to do with ABA. And, and I think actually they have not really um, taken into the account the opposition on the ground, not realizing that we know we have we have signed a signatory. We are the signatories to the United Nations Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And yet when you when you when you come up with an ABA thing, uh, when you come up with a bill that has ABA provisions, that is also a total violation of the UNCRPD. And so far as I can tell you, the CR UNCRPD committee is doing uh is conducting like let's say a monitoring um assessment of countries whether or not they are complying with the crpd or not but in my own uh my own assessment is that kenya still though it has very good laws but from an international uh, human rights but, uh, standpoint, I don't think they are really complying with the law, especially with uh, uh, with Article 15 and 16 that talks about uh, ending torture and abuse of persons with disabilities, and in this case, autistic people, now that uh, we're trying as much as we can to ban ABA in Africa. And right now, as, as I can speak to you, Kenya is, on the verge of introducing ABA, and um, and some of us are not happy about it. Yeah, I think uh, you bring up a very uh, important topic there with uh, the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, so the CRPD. Again, I think this may be interesting to reflect on from the perspective of uh, yeah, ABA being currently so pervasive in the US, right? If we think about the United States in terms of um, human rights, I think we can see how this is a potential uh, problem, right? And uh, I think in terms of um, moving forward against ABA and banning ABA, may require different approaches and different geographies depending on 
um, what country you'll find yourself in. So the approach, the most appropriate approach for the United States may be uh, quite different from approaches in, in other countries that have, uh, have, for example, ratified the CRPD and, um, and so forth. Um, yeah, this is, I'd like to link to that. May I, Jean? Yeah, yes, please. sorry. Pardon. Usually I pronounce your name in the German when suddenly, suddenly something happened <laughs> to my head. I want to link to something that Karen said, um, you know, that the people on the ground were not considered. One of the fundamental, well, the thing that the CRPD was actually founded on was the principle of nothing about us without us. So you can't go and introduce legislation without consulting the us, which in this case would be the autistic people of Kenya. Now, I understand that a lot of autistic people in Kenya have been so kept in isolation, they may not be diagnosed, they may not, they may not be briefed to participate in legislative processes. But that doesn't mean they can be left out of them. That means that that work to prepare them to actually take contextual decisions and to see the bigger picture has to be done. It's the same as with research. They keep telling me that the lab rats can't actually be part of the study design. Well, that's because you're not into participatory design. You haven't actually trained your lab rats to actually not be lab rats, but to train them to be you know, your, your co-partners in the research. Mm -hmm. So that nothing about us without us is a very key tenant. And that's what it's all about. If people go and hana hana about, sorry, that's an immobile word. <laughs> it's like if they carry on talking nonsense, um, about you know arguing about some clause and they get too too complicated around it. You can always bring them back to what is the whole CRPD actually about? It's about nothing about us without us. And you know, Karen also often mentions um, comment notes. Uh, what is it? 27, 2018. No, sorry, comment note seven. Yes, um, which it clarifies exactly what is meant by how do you get representation. You know, it's like it's not the represent, it's not the parent bodies, it's not the disability service organization, it's the actual people who have that disability who need to elect their own people to represent them. It's the same as if it was a government, you know, it shouldn't be that difficult to understand. The other thing that I want to link into what Karen uh, was talking about in terms of talking about the COPD is actually the model of disability, which is based on now earlier on, you explained the social model. So for those who don't know the different models, just quickly, briefly, the, the, there were actually four that you generally thought of. The one is the charity model where you say that um, disabled people exist to uh, like glorify God or to um, to make us show our, how good we non-disabled people are by giving to these poor suffering people. And that makes us better people and we can learn from them and all that, but, you know, that is, have some kind of a semi-religious context and they are there to receive our arms. We must give to them and that makes us better people because we're giving to the poor and to the disabled. So that's the one model. The other model is, and it's typically in that kind of thing as well, where disabled people are encouraged to be an inspiration by seeing, by being so, you know, happy with their lot and um, shiny eyed that why can't the rest of us all see the world in such a great way because these, these, horrible people or well, these, these these poor people um <laughs> they're so happy so we should all be happy you know it's that kind of stuff the second one there's the medical model where it's like oh okay disability is not actually there it's not anything magical but it, but it is because your body is broken then you get the social model which says well maybe your body is broken and maybe your body is not broken whichever way um the problem is that society is not including you so maybe you had your eyes you know burnt by a flame and that's why you can't see but society is making it difficult for people who don't have their eyes and so the social model is society is the problem even a guy without eyes should actually be okay the human rights model is like the social model and that's the one that the uncrpd is founded on so it is founded on saying yeah 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 society is you know, the problem, we may also have problems, maybe it was an injury, maybe it was some kind of a malfunction, maybe whatever, but that's not the big deal. The problem is we have rights and the rights should be, would be dealt with. So it takes the social model one step further. The social model kind of assigns blame <laughs> and then the human rights model says, well, uh, okay, so we got to fix this. And this is a, the focus is on the fixing of that, the addressing, or redressing or the accommodations and everything that needs to be done to level the playing field. So yeah, so there are, there are those three aspects. I just wanted to also comment the, the, the terminology which you've introduced, like neuronormative versus neurotypical. I am going to use that so much from now. And also the term which 
which Bruce introduced. Uh, this, this makes conversations, I think, just a lot easier. Having to explain neurotypical, which is not really a biological thing, mm -hmm. because that's always been difficult. So, yeah. Um, I would like to, I'm going to hand back to you now for a moment because I don't want to monopolize the time, but I would love to get back to explaining the, the hows and the whys and how the torture is linked to academia and everything, why this really is a serious matter and why the, the guys who are the hotshots in ABA today are really not the, the revolutionary changing and making it all pretty nowadays, you know, leading yeah. it. But um, over to you for a minute. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, just coming back to, to um, Karen and uh, what, what's going on in Kenya, I think um, it would be very interesting to understand how um, ABA is being introduced and is spreading in Kenya. Um, the people who are involved in administering ABA in Kenya, where do they currently get trained? Are there institutions in Kenya that train up ABA professionals? Um, or are these, as I think Tanya explained um, in other places, um, are these people trained overseas? How does how has ABA even arrived in Kenya? And uh, yeah. what is that situation? Is there, yeah. and who is moving against that, if anyone? Um, what is that like? Major, um, majority of those who are trained in OAB are trained overseas uh, in the US. <laughs> yeah. So majority of the practitioners, uh, the ABA practitioners are trained uh, in the United States and in particular in wow. um, Boston, in Massachusetts. So <laughs> yeah. Um, That's neocolonialism, right? Of course, <laughs> yes. They are but, trained in. Yeah. Is that uh, I'm going to be changing um, soon, current where they establish this new organization, PABA, and that they've got some kind of like trying to decentralize or have the training actually yeah. happen in Africa? Is that already yeah. in the pipeline? It is definitely. It's like it's in the pipeline. Um, and just recently, now, uh, now a lot of parents have gone to, uh, who have been trained uh, uh, to become BCBAs are definitely getting all those kind of trainings from from uh, BCBAs from all over the, the U.S. Um, and so, um, majority of parents who uh, and even even those who work with autistic children in Kenya get if they want to become BCBAs, they have to get their accredited training in the United States. So, yeah. So that's wow. how it is like, yes. This is really interesting to hear and it confirms what we uh, heard earlier from Marie in the Philippines. It's the same situation. Um, yeah. uh, people engaged with ABA are trained overseas in the UK or the US and then uh, they mm. take those techniques to, to their own uh, countries. So we can see oh, yeah. uh, we've had so it's really, it's a new form of uh, new colonialism. I mean, we have this in economics going on now for decades, right? And this seems to be, uh, if that's no longer working well enough, well, we need to sort of uh, come up with harder ways, right? Or with more uh, invasive ways. And I think ABA seems to be uh, the prime candidate here. So, and <laughs> if you look at how, ABA is operating in the US, it's an industry, it's a profit driven multi billion dollar industry. Um, and they're talking about return on investment and things like that. So um, this is so tied into the economic uh, neoliberal doctrine, it's nauseating. Well, I can actually be quite specific there if I can come in Jan, at this stage to talk about like how they do this as well. Um, so a I want to talk a little bit before I link up to this, because what I'm coming to is SABA, which is the ABAI's um, missionary arm, if I can call it that. It's a business development arm, but it's the they they have sponsorships where, where they will fund small startups in ABA in countries like Ghana, for example. And so they'll put dollars into it. And so and that is like a the charity thing, because it's 
you know, it's like with, with any colonial missionary thing, really, there's, there's part religion and zeal, and there's part commercial. So that is definitely running like this. But I want to, how did we get to this point? Come back to this point. Um, for those who don't know what the Judge Rokenberg Center is, um, or, or even those who do, you know, it's a school in the USA, which is often seen as a fringe thing in ABA because they use electric shocks on their, some of the inmates um, to get them to behave. So they use punishment. Uh, and they found it, in fact, for, unlike the guys from, from um, P, PBS, which is a form, form of ABA, which prides itself kind of in not being punishment based, although they actually are, but, you know, they, they, they try to focus on positive reward them for doing the things the way they work. The JRC, the Judd Rotenberg Center, it's founded, he believed the opposite. He believed that punishment was more beneficial than rewards, that it was a stronger motivator. And he actually applied that in his own life as well. You know, he would threaten himself with things if he didn't meet certain personal goals. Um, and he'd, he'd, he'd actually tell people what his threat was so that they could hold him to account and carry out the threat if, if necessary. So, yeah, so that is like a cruel thing, which is sometimes being seen by those who know of the place as this is fringe, not all ABA is like that, you know, you know, we've modernized, we don't use electric trucks on people, we don't treat people cruelty, really, we don't use punishment. Aha. That institution it had another name before. Now called it was now it was renamed after a judge who defended them when they were challenged on the amount of abuse which they were giving to people. So this judge defended them and then the you know they were kind of allowed to continue the abuse. So they named the renamed the institution after him. Um, it was founded in 1971. Four years later was the founding of the uh, thank you, the Alex has gone and said Behavioral Research Institute, that's what it used to be called. So four years later, we saw the establishment of ABAI, this inter, supposedly uh, interdisciplinary, or, or, you know, this association, which was to set standards for ABA and have conferences and do publications. These two institutions, the institution and the association, actually very closely linked from that time. The founders, the first chairman, you know, these like board members on the one side overlapped with board members and influential people on the other side, names like Mallet, for example, Richard Mallet, um, who were working at Judge Rotenberg Center, who were so esteemed and had high roles in ABAI. And that thread, has carried through to this day. They will always be people who are high up in this torture place. I don't know, want to talk about the word torture for a moment, why I'm using that word, uh, why I'm not just being ex exaggerating that you know, ABA is abusive and we all like to call it torture. But no, in this case, I actually seriously mean that there are people outside, outside the critics you know, of ABA who will also call it torture. So um, there has always been this thread. To this day, that one of the board members of the Judge Rotenberg Center, Josh Pritchard, uh, who will on social media shut down what survivors say they went through there and delete their comments from his Facebook, you know, uh, he is has his finger in a whole bunch of different places. The one is uh, on. SABA, I don't know whether they call it SABA or just SABA, which is the, the missionary and business development arm. He is on the accreditation uh, board, where, in other words, that sets the standards for when you must, when you study ABA at a university to become a BCBA or to become one of these things, what standards and what ethics and whatever should you comply with. He's influential in that. So this guy basically who says that torture is okay, torture with electric shocks to punish you, six times as strong as the strongest shock that is normally given what, you know, to, to humans in any other kind of place. Even the paramedics won't be on standby to give anybody shock like that, you know. So this guy is involved in this and in this and in this. And so now when a, a couple of, thanks to advocacy, you know, a lot of, uh, BCBAs became aware even that this place existed and that they're doing all these terrible things and they said no there should be a we must put out a statement against it so the leaders of ABAI 
come up and they say, oh, okay, we will put together a task team. We like all of our other task teams, except they don't have task teams for anything else except for this. Um, so our task team will come up with a position statement. We will get some experts to do that. So who do they get in as experts to see whether this torture, sorry, I must probably pause to actually clarify that. The United Nations um, Special Rapporteur on Torture already a decade ago declared this to be torture. And the Rapporteur on Torture who replaced him, his successor, also declared this to be torture. So these are experts on torture. I kind of think that they would know torture when they see torture. So, right. So the ABI puts together a panel. Instead of saying like, oh my goodness, yes, this fringe outfit here, we should cancel them. <laughs> you know, They shouldn't be part of our, our group where they should be kicked out. No, because they happen to be the founders and the overlaps and the whatever and the people who have the finger in the pie and everything. Um, this, no, we will we will put together a panel and then we will come up with a with a um, statement, um, a position. So who gets to be on the panel? Well, some people who are experts not in human rights, not in torture, but in using punishment as part of ABA. In fact. Um, one of the, uh, the, the, the specialists works with Richard Mallet, who was one of the early people involved in the Judge Rotenberg Center. They actually work within the same department at the University of West Michigan, which was the actual original home, by the way, of ABAI. So if this is not conflicts of interest and same people actually busy over here, you know, <laughs> You, you put together a panel on, on, on to, to see whether the torture is okay. And then basically what they decide is how much torture should be done. So they haven't issued their statement, but they've in, issued an interim kind of report. And that thing didn't go down really well with the audience because BCBAs are really starting to wise up and all other behavior analysts are starting to wise up. But there's some bad stuff is going down here and some of them don't really want to be associated with this. And so there are some who are kind of like feeling they want to leave this or they, they're not ex exactly sure what to do. This links up with your earlier statement now um, on maybe the approach to banning ABA should be different in different countries. Yes, in the USA where it is already government fund funded, it is so entrenched that it's part of the habit of poorer families, for example, it's a place for their child to go during the day. They don't have a nanny. They don't have a caregiver and they can't afford one. So the government is giving them a caregiver in the form of a behavior therapist. And if that gets taken away, then they don't, then they're going to have problems. So there's complexities like that, which are they, which we don't really have here in, in Africa yet, and which we would certainly want to stop. And over here, it makes sense to actually drive for legislation to stop this before this starts to take root in that way. For us to heavily drive the CRPD, because we're signatory countries here. Um, and I could di digress onto what is already being achieved in this regard in South Africa, because it's actually going relatively well with, yeah. with our yeah. motion toward banning ABA. With the USA, though, because it's this entrenched, we are engaging with um, with BCBAs directly, and they're looking at reform. Okay, that's what they talk about. We don't believe that ABA can be reformed, but we are having co reform conversations because it is better that they do things which are not quite as awful than that they that they put, you know don't do anything at all. So we know that this is a compromise. We know that this is actually not okay. We know it's it's incompatible with logic. Yeah. But we will still engage them in conversation. And some of them end up leaving because they actually realize that what they you know you can't fix this. Yeah. But I that's think really what we should point out here is that in order because so much damage is being done by ABA in places like uh, the UK, um, the US, and, and, and in the much of the um, English speaking world, basically, um, and uh, increasingly also here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, uh, there, we, we, we have goals, the neurodiversity movement or the artistic rights movement with goals uh, on different time horizons, right? There are things that are urgently needed in the short term, in the medium term, and then there are long-term goals, right? And we need to, different people in the movement are working on different uh, time horizons, and that's good. I mean, we can't all do everything at once. 
And that needs to be, I think, understood by the wider public in order not to get confused, right? I mean, not that these goals relating to different time horizons, I mean, um, our opponents like to then criticize this, ah, there's confusion in the movement, right? We are not all aligned. This, I call out the bullshit. It's, uh, I think um, we are, there's an increasing level of international consensus on this. It's just, uh, we all folk do our little part uh, towards uh, the overall um, goal of um, completely removing the, the social license uh, for, for things like, um, ABA. And I think um, what we are discovering here in this discussion is that the autistic community actually, um, yeah, because we're not new normative people, we're the opposite. That's why we uh, get um, excluded um, in, in many societies. We're actually in a very good position to identify new norm normative cultural bias. So I think, um, Tanya, you just illustrated this, you know, uh, you very, uh, are very capable of pointing out all these vested interests that uh, are woven into this um, industrial autism uh, complex. So, and now how do we get to a point where um, research in the social sciences and particular yeah, disciplines like psychology. Um, how do we get to ethical research designs? Um, what level of, well, what role should autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people play um, in, in shaping research agendas in the social sciences? Um, and how do we create credible research institutions, teaching you know, uh, institutions and so forth. And there, I would like to use the opportunity to point out uh, the design justice principles that uh, are actually principles that have been developed by disability rights activists, not limited to autistic people. So I'll post a link to, to those principles in the chat. I'll make it available on the web page as well. Um, I think the design justice principles, um, and there's an organization um, also, you know, Design Justice Network that you can join, um, the, which I think is ideally positioned to uh, establish a transdisciplinary coalition of allies um, that uh, is capable of really uh, of ensuring that there's really nothing about us without us. Um, I think um, we need strong allies because the autistic communities worldwide, I mean, we are a fairly small minority uh, wherever we are, um, yet there are many other disability uh, rights activists and disabled people, uh, if we we can use the design justice principle to build, I think, broad alliances. And um, these design justice principles, which are the result of a grassroots movement, they are urgently needed to, as, as part of um, ethical um, supervision of research agendas, right? Ethical ethics control boards and things like that, rather than the people of the establishment coming up with rules that suit their own agendas, uh, these grassroots principles need to be adopted. So anyone who would like to comment on this, your thoughts are welcome and I'm conscious of time. So we've got two uh, panelists from Canada. So Alex Kronstein and um, then we've got um, let's see is, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. <laughs> so uh, I I, I'll paste the link and I would like Alex to, to introduce uh, himself and uh, yeah, then we go forward. Uh, hi everyone, hi, hi Yorn, hi, uh, hi Tanya. Oh, hi, Karen and Zoe. Uh, I'm Alex Kronstein. I'm uh, from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada. 
Um, so yeah, I, uh, I guess you could say I'm the, well, I, I guess I'm the person who originally started um, the uh, ABA protest day. It was a couple of years ago. It was in, that was in response to um, the infamous uh, Cardgate scandal. Uh, if you, those of you who don't know that, I'll put uh, just a second here. I'll put I'll put the uh, links in the chat here, and uh, you can uh, post the links there uh, later. Um, just a second here. Uh, second here. Okay, so there are the links there that you can read. That was back in 2017. Um, this is the uh, 2018, 2019. This is the, the first one was um, in, tw in 2018, I believe. Uh, yeah, this is the, the fifth uh, card gate, the fifth card gate scandal. So this is the fifth annual ABA protest day. It uh, appears to have been a little uh, quieter this year on social media, lar largely because um, I think a lot of us are kind of are uh, just uh, busy, with, busy with other things these days. And of course, you know, dealing with a lot of other stuff like a uh, continuing pandemic and other stuff. Uh, so yeah. I think it's also because there are, there's actually, it, it is uh, so many other ABA, anti-ABA actions are mm -hmm. also happening now as a result of the kind of things that you did in the early days. It, you know, it, the spin-offs happen, not even all of the activists talk to each other because sometimes we've got internal fights. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter whether we're not unified because we're taking different approaches and we're moving in the same direction. And that is kind of what's part of what's happening at the moment. So you can be actually quite happy about there's other stuff going on out there, which is part of what we, we're trying to achieve. Agreed. So that's pretty cool. Agreed. Definitely, agreed. Sorry if, I, sorry if I sound a little bit uh, slow today. I'm just uh, a little tired because I barely got any sleep at all last night. Um, so uh, what else? Uh, so yeah, lots of uh, great anti-ABA actions have been happening in the last uh, year, year really. I mean, ASAN just re released a one great toolkit uh, for whose benefit, which is excellent if you haven't yeah. seen that. Which yeah. is the you should. Um, there's a great article in um just a second here. Uh, a great AB article in Fortune back in May called uh, The Autistic Community is Having a Reckoning with ABA Therapy. We should listen. That that's excellent. The fact that it was in Fortune magazine, which often talks about a uh, which is like a major business on website, that's a, was was excellent. And also, there was a good article recently in uh, The Pointer, which is an online news site in uh, Brampton, Ontario, I believe. Uh, just a second here. Yes, uh, here it is. Yeah, Inside the controversy surrounding the most popular therapy on autistic children in Ontario. This is a, I put the link in the chat there. This, this is uh, another wonderful uh piece uh and it uh of course of course it really pissed off the pro aba parents in ontario big time so yeah also um we've got a couple of um political candidates here in canada who have been opposing aba too and which has really really pissed off the um pro aba parents here um, in the last federal election, um, we had a number of federal NDP candidates who uh, openly spoke out against ABA, which um, and that, and that wow. was pretty, which is pretty impressive because at the provincial level in Ontario, the uh, the Ontario NDP, the provincial NDP in Ontario, has is well known for being quite pro ABA, and a lot, and some of their um, MPPs have been really, really uh, shitty towards autistic activists. Uh, but these federal NDP candidates, who are many of whom are neurodivergent themselves, were, they, they were uh, much better in that regard. So um, yeah, I mean, we got some good article, great uh, news piece, great journalism pieces. Uh, I, I was also interviewed for um, uh, CBC, 
uh, earlier this year. It was, it was more of a general piece on uh, supports for autistic people. Um, but I did mention, I, I did talk about uh, uh, ABA actually. I'm just gonna, uh, uh, here we go. Uh, here's a good, here's a good, uh, just a second. Here's the CBC article. This is a, I, I mean, I, I included there towards um, the end. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and also locally here, um, we have more, we have some more um, neurotypical parents. So, sorry, should, should I say holistic parents speaking out against um, ABA and its derivatives like EIBI and which is what, which is what's used here in Nova Scotia. So um, that's really a uh, that's pretty impressive as well. That actually is quite similar to what is happening in South Africa. There is a a movement. It's not to say that there aren't a lot of places that are doing ABA, but example, I, I was recently um, introduced to a, a, um, a music therapist because I have a friend who became a music therapist as a result of his interest in his own autistic nephew and then talking to me and he's actually an award-winning local musician and so he passed on a music therapist he said she's going to be wanting to set up a practice near where you live can you introduce her to people and so on and she doesn't necessarily know a lot of autistic context and what was interesting was I did not know this woman from a bar of soap but one of the first things she said to me is like I'm glad to get to know you I just want to tell you one thing I really hope that you don't support ABA because it's such a heartbreaking thing for me as a music therapist to see what they do to children. And I was like, don't worry, I don't support ABM. It's like kind of making an understatement British style. And she kept on bringing it up in our conversations. And I'm like, I'm actually part of an international ban ABA movement, so you really don't have to worry about it. But it's, it, it repeats itself over and over. You know, where she's looking for clients, she says, Oh my goodness! And you know that school where I'm wanting to get clients, they they do ABA as well. And she's just so sad about this the whole time. And I I mentioned her because she's an example of what I'm starting to see all over in in therapist groups in in among allied health professionals. You talk about ABA, you know, and they're like do not do that. And so the OTs come and the speech and language therapists, and there's a whole lot of them coming and they strongly taking a stand. No, this is wrong. And it's like, in the past, we used to have to convince them and they were passing off clients to the ABA guys, you know, the professionals would get, oh, you take the child for, for occupational therapy this day, and then I'll take him for speech, and, you know, and then he's with ABA. They're like, just don't do ABA. They're not, they're not wanting to refer to people. That, and that's been the effect of consistent advocacy, just relentlessly um, putting out the word there that m most autistic people are against this. And I do think that we need to, at some stage, address the issue of autistic people who are pro-ABA, who are ABA therapists themselves, and who, who are autism moms themselves, and they're autistic, but they, they are very much in favor of you know, restraint and <laughs> all the things that we're against. You know, there's, the, what we see in that area is that there's a, a kind of a, two things that run in parallel. When you like ABA very much, you tend to not like AAC users very much. Mm. People who use augmentative alternative forms of communication like typing on an ipad pointing to letters using a signed language and for that to be your main form of communication or whether you have multimodal in that they may say oh yes but we also have that we have pics as part of aba but you know what <laughs> they will point you towards the autistic favorites you know listen to this autistic favorite listen to that one you know they say aba is cool you will not find them pointing to any AAC users as favorites. They, you know, they'll have a conference and they'll have this pro ABA person. They just, they just don't seem to like non-speaking people to communicate. And as soon as they can communicate, they start questioning whether it's really even them speaking or somebody set them up to it. Because it's always been this zone. In fact, the Lancet Commission on the Future of Autism 
can't remember the exact title of that, all these yes, people yes. who came out who wanted to say we must have a thing called profound autism and that the solution to all of this is, is ABA, I mentioned it so many times in that, uh, that study. They don't really like listening to non-speaking people and people, mm -hmm. other AAC users. So now that in South Africa, the rights of non-speakers Oops. Africa's first activist who has founded his own NGO. He's about to start a tour of South Africa in September. Um, Tanya, I think your internet connection is uh, very bad at the moment. You're freezing. So, and okay. I. So maybe we'll just uh, wait yes, and, and I would and like to give up. Alex some more uh, time yes, here um, to talk about um, his perspective in Canada and also to circle back to the core theme here of this panel, um, the banning the teaching of, of ABA. Um, so in this conversation with Roy's um, panelists, we, we started to explore um, this topic and uh, we broadened the theme uh, because teaching happens in um, university settings. So uh, the question really is teaching research agendas and research and how does currently cultural new normative bias uh, creep into all of this and prevent um, change um, and yeah Alex do you have any specific thoughts on how you see um, the, the teaching of ABA band and and how you see this um, the, the relationship between teaching and then research because I think in order to ban teaching we need to examine what is happening in research. And we need to uh, realize that there's no shortage of people at the moment, because as long as um, the teaching of ABA isn't banned, also future research in the direction of ABA or improvements of ABA is not banned, right? So um, we cannot have an effective ban on uh, the teaching of ABA if there is, uh, as long as we allow a research in that basically just use different terminology um, to, to skirt around the ban. So Alex, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I don't really, I don't think of anything off the top of my head on that at the moment. I would say, and um, before we can, I will say before we can outright ban it, that teaching, ban the teaching of ABA at all, uh, we need to help people have a better understanding of like why it's harmful, why autistic people and their autistic allies um, um, oppose it so much, and uh, learn about um, alternatives as well. Like I know there's um, in the fall, there's going to be a, a, a big alternatives to ABA conference. It's being hosted by Awesome Training in uh, in Ireland. That's it's going to be a that's going to be a really important conference. I'm going to that. Um, and I suggest you all you sign up for that as well. It's going to be a really good one. Uh, what else? There's also um, there's a new book coming out um, in January, I believe. Uh, it's being published by Jessica Kingsley. It's uh, called, um, just a second, what's the, just I need the exact title of it, stand by here. Yeah, this, this is going to be a really good book. It's yeah, the exact title is um, I Will Die on This Hill, Autistic Adults, Autism Parents, and the Children Who Deserve a Better World. It's written by Megan Ashburn and Jules Edwards. Megan Ashburn from uh, page uh, Not an Autism Mom and Jules Edwards uh, from uh, of Autistic Typing. Uh, I actually got a review copy of this book ahead of time. And I can ass assure you it's the very best autism book that I've ever read, ever. Wow. Wow. And, it's, and uh, that's gonna be really, um, 
And that's going to be a real game changer for everyone who um, reads it. I can, I can assure you that right now. It's, uh, it's going, to, going to be great. So and I, could Ma Megan had her child in ABA, right? No, I, no, I don't think, no, no, no. No. Yeah, but this is going to be an, ex an excellent book. It's going to be, uh, it's like I said, it's the best autism book I've ever read, and it's going to be a huge game changer. But this is going to be, uh, it's not about ABA specifically, although it does talk about ABA, but it's, it's more of um, more about, about, like, the, about the divide between autistic advocates and parents of autistic children and how to um, like resolve the differences between the two of the two groups. But, the, but it's, uh, it's an excellent it's it's an excellent book that's all that's all i can keep telling you that right now but you're going to love it a lot yeah so um and uh, and of course uh for those maybe some of you here don't um i think some of you here may know it some of you don't i am a filmmaker i'm currently working on a major documentary it's going to expose the truth about aba i've um I've been going to various, um, I, I have my own production company as well. I've got a producer out in BC who's helping me with this. Uh, we've had a couple of setbacks uh, uh, here and there. We actually had a rather significant setback just yesterday. But uh, that's not to say people don't like it. They just think it just doesn't fit with their, um, their, their, uh, their, their strategy. That's all I can I can't really give a few details about this right now, but let's just say um, we've had setbacks here and there. We're just going to keep uh, finding a way to push it forward. Um, so yeah, I'm going I'm going to another uh, big uh, industry conference in a couple of weeks and uh, get some thought, thoughts on that. Um, yeah, it's been getting some it's been getting some decent attention. Um, of course, it's always a matter of just getting the proper funding in place so we can actually um, get it made. But it's going to happen. Uh, it's got, it's got a little bit of funding here and there, but it's not nearly enough to get it uh, to get it complete, of course. But uh, it's it's going decently well. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just seeing a very interesting uh, comment here in the in the chat. So I'll read this. The challenge is also that within the public education system, many teachers do not know that they are teaching ABA. I can attest to this from my own experience in dealing with public schools in the USA. So I think uh, this is another important observation here that um, ABA is just one label for a set of very harmful techniques. And these techniques uh, come in various guises. Um, we can actually look at our um, Western public, uh, school systems um, across the board, and uh, if we consider how how our education is structured um, with all these predetermined milestones and so forth, the limited level of um, variab individual variability and respect for individual needs and preferences that is given in these systems, um, you, you can argue that our entire education system is a form of um, ABA light, right? And, and in various disciplines, then I, people who move into education, they are trained and I think some um, techniques and methods that um, uh, make sure be very harmful to uh, autistic children in, in particular. Um, and yeah, so yeah, the I mean, ABA, the out. use of ABA techniques is not limited to, to be applied by um, ABA technicians. Um, these harmful techniques, they exist in sort of less formalized settings within our education system as well. To, there, there are a number of other people who've pointed out the exact same thing and elaborated on it greatly. One of them is Oswin Latimer, who is also, uh, you know, believes in banning ABA, but also in the pragmatism of this in the USA, that's not likely to happen that quickly, partially. And, as, and Oswin was one who pointed out all these kind of obstacles, the one that I mentioned earlier about the babysitting role, the, the pervasiveness of it, but also the pervasiveness of 
that authoritarianism is kind of thought of as okay by a lot of people, especially with the, the, the rise of well, the, the way in which the Republican Party has changed, because it might always have been conservative, might always have been quite religious, might always have been all of these things, but it wasn't, it was a democratic, as much as a, a conqueror's institution can be considered democratic, but it, it relied on, you know, the concept of voting and the vote of the majority of eligible voters. That has changed so radically, um, and the with the element of authoritarianism, already pervasive even kind of before that in terms of the child's authority over the parent, the headmaster's authority over this. It's a lot more difficult for people in certain parts of the world to actually see uh, that the basis of ABA is being wrong. It's only when you get to extremes like that they're torturing these people with electric shocks that they can kind of see that, oh, that's not. But the early stages that progresses to there, from the mm -hmm. planned ignoring to the seclusion to the restraint to the whatever eventually you get yeah, those yeah. those abuse. They don't see in the early stages that that is so bad. And I actually had a recent, I just posted a tweet on Twitter where I said that uh, many people don't realize that the extreme insecurity around um, just a basic rejection of, uh, no, I just, I don't want to do this. Or somebody not getting back to you after you've phoned them, that it's not. A personal rejection you it, it could be somebody's just busy or perhaps they're a bit overwhelmed by having so many people that they need to deal with you're taking it that personally because your parents always um, ignored you when you were a child and that may not have been formal aba that may have been a parent thinking don't yeah. feed their weakness i mean no you must let them cry out and so on all of those things and alfie Cohn is another person who's pointed out the problems with all those things they're so pervasive in yes. what people think of good parent is good parenting, yeah. but it's not something the parents two hundred years ago would have done in the same way. Correct. It is yeah. a, a mm -hmm. relatively this, modern way of thinking about parenting. Yep, this yeah. goes back to cultural bias in this mm -hmm. modern industrial era uh, and how parenting and education is influenced um, by well what's this uh, industrialized culture basically establishes in terms of uh, social expectations and their norms and um, parents have been indoctrinated in this environment and uh, they then apply these expectations to their own children and end up harming um, and traumatizing their children um, with their own cultural expectations um, without even noticing it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it is only um, yeah. hypersensitive autistic children and other uh, neurodivergent children that, um, well, they are the canneries in the coal mine at the receiving end and they suffer and they get traumatized. Mm -hmm. And so I would just like yeah, to- as well, but the others somehow survive that trauma. You know, yeah. they, well, the, the, that trauma stays with us for so long, right? I mean, mm. you can even see this in the diagnostic, so called diagnostic criteria for autism in the DSM the overlap yeah. between these characteristics. I mean, we talked about that earlier in the panel <laughs> um, the overlap between those criteria and the symptoms of uh, severely traumatized people. Uh, is staggering. So um, you're rare to oh. find a non-traumatized autistic person. Yes. And by the time uh, a child gets picked up uh, and then noticed, say, by a pediatrician or something that, uh, well, maybe this child is autistic, many of those children are already highly traumatized by their social environment. That's the kind and it's of not culture just that we're in today. Yeah, it's not just by the social environment. Even as you mentioned, as I can echo what Tanya has mentioned in regards to parenting. Yes, parenting can really play a very divisive role. Uh, you find that there's some parents who grew up in that culture of, uh, I'm a very religious person, of spare the rod, spoil the child. So they come from that kind of era where um, they, they, display, they use discipline as a tool to try and fix the child's behavior. 
Um, and this is very synonymous here in, uh, in Kenya. We've seen uh, parents uh, go at length in assaulting and physically abusing their disabled children because they, they are not measuring up to their expectations. There was one very heartbreaking video that, uh, that has surfaced on social media and thankfully the person has been uh, arrested. He was caught um, on video disciplining his physically disabled son. And uh, when I was watching that video, I was very heartbroken. And then in the in the audio recording, he said, "Yeah, it, it was in Kiswahili." And there was one person who asked him, "Why why are you doing this to a child? Why are you doing this to your child?" And he says, "Like you know, he's not. I've tried to tell him several times, and he doesn't listen. You know, blah 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 blah." And it's coming from that kind of uh, parental uh, cultural aspect. So it's like. We need to address why why this kind of cultural uh, thing is happening, especially when it comes to what we're talking about right now with ABA. Uh, some of us, like, including myself, have gone to some form of ABA, and it's not uh, that was like the 1980s ABA, and and I still live to that kind of traumatic experience, not only in school, but also inside families. And also families can also uh, have a very negative impact on you. And you don't know about it because they are ingrained in trying to fix you because they see you as a problem. And that is very synonymous, especially in Kenya, where a lot of persons with disabilities, especially autistic people, face a lot of uh, stigmatization and abuse. Yeah, this is, thank you very much, Karen. Um, yeah, that I think um, reflects uh, my experience as well with uh, parenting approaches in, all, in different cultures. And this, uh, I think maybe I'll just um, circle back to this observation that normativity is relative to culture um, and there is no such thing as one form of normativity. and so new divergence and then um, autistic ways of being people who sort of completely fall out of this the normative expectations what exactly that group of people is can vary from culture to culture what is though common is that those people who are uh, perceived by their own culture as uh, diverging far from the local social expectations, um, they, you could say, they have the autistic social experience within their culture. And in, and since I think across the world, you know, we are all we are part of this global economic system. So the economic doctrine, I mean, this is something that exists globally, this hyper-competitive doctrine. Um, and that I think uh, exerts a lot of pressure irrespective as to what the details of the local culture are. I think it drives many parents to this, um, yeah, disciplinary approach that is damaging to, hypersensitive uh, children. Um, Do you know what the irony of that is? Um, when so South Africa um, pointed out something about the constitution that, it, that it's unconstitutional, there was a kind of like, I don't remember exactly what it's called, the constitutional court, um, which determines what, what, what laws should be made. They don't actually make the law, they say this is constitutional, so therefore. So we have a quite a good constitution, but every now and again, something has to be pointed out or amended. So one of the things that they said is that you should not, nobody is allowed to actually hit their child. They're not, you're not allowed to do um, physical punishment on your child. And so when they made this declaration, I mean, one of the other declarations they were was the legalize that, that um, cannabis should be legalized for within certain boundaries. So, so when they did the thing about the children who shouldn't uh, use physical violence against your child, there were a lot of black parents, particularly, not only black parents, other religious parents, white as well, other races as well, who said, but the black ones were saying like, but this is within our black cultural tradition to, this is how we discipline children. But what they did not know 
is that it actually did not come from black tradition. It came from white colonists who beat their servants, who beat their slaves, and ended up in people beating their black children. And then thinking, so when, when the, the white liberals who were in wealthy families said, we don't, we're not going to do this anymore, and they got all you know soft about the whole thing, and they're not going to beat their children anymore, we're going to talk to them, we're going to do all these nice psychology things on children now. And the black parents were going like, yeah, whatever, this is like nonsense. Because the, it had be, they had thought that the beatings came from their culture. It didn't. You know, and you actually had to point out, no, this is not how it works. It's yeah. like you, you, think, you think it's an African thing to do all this violence. The colonists brought it to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's right. I mean, we have to realize that colonization is, is not a new concept. It's been around for hundreds of years now. And so the current living generations, um, uh, it, it's it's very difficult to separate uh, yeah, what, what, what's come exactly from where. And this is where it's been very interesting from what I have been learning from uh, Maori uh, people here in Aotearoa and, and about uh, Maori cultures, and I'm talking the plural here because there are many different Maori cultures here, uh, but there are certain commonalities and um, an interesting aspect of this country also is that it's never officially been colonized. Um, this uh, uh, country right. here is based on the Treaty of Waitangi, um, uh, which is a partnership between the British um, Crown and the local uh, tribes. And um, this treaty exists both in well, it was written down in, in Mali, and it was also then, um, there's an English version of it. And there you can really, I mean, studying this and, and reading um, the, well, the scholarly work from uh, Mali rights activists, uh, modern Mali rights activists, really is very highly educational in terms of understanding how cultural bias has crept into our society here. Um, our current society as it exists today. And the interesting thing about this country is that here, um, this, well, imperialism arrived fairly late in the piece. So it's well recorded, it's well understood. Um, and so it starts with the different use of language um, in Maori and the different conceptualization even in languages, right? Some of these, um, European concepts didn't exist in this culture. So how do you translate them, right? You can imagine how this, right from the start, uh, there are interpretational differences that have been very conveniently glossed over by the British um, and that have led to very entrenched forms of oppression where you really, I mean, the difference between what's happened here and what's happened in, 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 in proper, in quotes, colonies, is, is minimal or sometimes there's no difference whatsoever. It's the same thing, it's just more subtle, right? And that reminds me very much uh, with the way that sometimes these torture techniques of a ABA are just a form of marketing, right? Uh, um, sugar coating, highly harmful um, approaches. Um, and what I was gonna say is in terms of parenting, um, the it was very interesting, the, European, I think, missionaries who arrived here in the early days, they commented on the uh, on the complete lack of discipline that is being applied to children here. So uh, if you look at, the point here is, if you look at indigenous societies, the way they existed before Europeans arrived, well, you don't find this kind of discipline that um, we are so familiar with uh, in Europe, right? And in the Western parts of the world. And um, that is very, very easily forgotten. And um, we should therefore listen wherever we can, we should listen to indigenous communities uh, that have had limited exposure to Western culture, or uh, at least where there is some written record and some you know, remaining knowledge of what, what came before the Europeans. This is where we can learn a lot about what it actually means to be human.
Um, Alex, do you want to comment? Because I think you've got indigenous communities as well in Canada, right? How, how is the intersectionality there between the in autistic communities and indigenous communities in Canada? Well, uh, I admit that uh, it's not. Well, uh, there have been some. Uh, well, I, to be honest, I, I, I'm ashamed, I'm embarrassed to admit this. I, ha I haven't really paid a whole lot of attention to uh, that. I know there, I know of some uh, very uh, well-known uh, Indigenous autistic activists, but uh, not many of them are from uh, Canada, actually. They're, more, they're ones from, um, uh, from the States. Now, there was recently a... Um, Did yeah. I just see some lightning outside? Hope that, hope that wasn't lightning. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, see it. Okay. Uh, there was a, a lot back. There was a um, just a second here. Just a second. I mean, this could, could also become, I think, an interesting research topic, right? How did parenting techniques and educational techniques operate in indigenous societies and and you know what can we learn from this so oh yes uh, okay there was actually uh earlier this year there was an interesting session on um um uh from an, from an indigenous an, an indigenous person um at the um, autism alliance of canada uh conference um uh it, it was about uh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce this. It's uh, uh, a Nehia perspective on autism. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the, the word. And mm -hmm. heard, um, it's uh, a guy uh, it's, it was hosted by uh, an indigenous person, um, uh, a, Cree, a Cree, I should say, a registered member of the Samson Cree Nation uh, in Alberta. Uh, he has, um, he's a PhD student and has four kids, two of whom are autistic. And I can't tell this, but I think, I don't think he's autistic himself though. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, still it was a really interesting session. Um, I have to go back and check and look at the recording. Um, but, but it was, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. there, I, mean, um, I think... I would just like to point out that we're touching on an interesting intersection here that is also worthwhile exploring further and, and in terms of uh, in the social science, um, you know, um, shaping research agendas and, and ethical review boards. Um, I think we need to urgently tackle this um, cultural bias in our universities that is, I think, still working against, uh, well, of course, um, non-Western cultures, and then also now against uh, yeah, new divergent uh, people of, of all kinds of uh, neurological um, dispositions. And these mm -hmm. intersections become very tangible. I mean, um, we are uh, creating uh, at the Autistic Collaboration Trust um, here locally in Aotearoa, we're creating very strong alliances with uh, Maori healthcare professionals, for example, um, with uh, neurodivergent Maori healthcare professionals. Um, and I've also had very um, educational conversations with neurodivergent uh, Maori people and autistic people who um, work in the prison system um, and there's no doubt that many of our incarcerated um, Maori people um, are autistic. So um, the oppression against um, autistic people and uh, indigenous people, there is a significant overlap. And um, I would like to encourage more alliance building along those areas and then Internationally, I think there's a huge chance for comparing notes and further sort of learning from each other. I think uh, we need to unearth what uh, our modern industrialized culture uh, has been doing to billions of people around this planet. And I think um, 
as autistic people, we're well positioned to do this. I mean, that's, I think, what autistic collaboration can be about. So earlier in this panel discussion, I think Alex uh, and Tanya, before you, you joined, we talked about this, that I would like to, because also in research, um, well, there is, because many universities have been corporatized and have been co-opted into uh, the, the, the system of oppression. So it's sometimes hard in the social sciences to get a critical research published. So that's something that we can do uh, via alternative means. And I would like to uh, use the Odds Collab uh, website, our website for this type of critical research um, and publications. So I'm would like to invite autistic rights activists to collaborate on um, developing our thinking around how do we uh, remove this cultural bias in our teaching and research institutions. Uh, what I'm thinking going forward is I would like to see um, co-authored articles on our website. I'm less and less interested in just writing articles myself. I would like to invite other people to write articles and I'm happy to co-author articles, but I would like the Autistic Collaboration website to be an example of autistic collaboration. Everything that goes on there should be a collaboration between mm -hmm. autistic people. And I think this will be a very powerful message. Um, does that make sense? Oh, definitely, yeah. So, and. And I think Alex, if I, you know, you're working on on a documentary, so you're more than welcome, you know, to uh, collaborate and to tap into all the material that we are trying to uh, pull together here. Um, mm -hmm. And let's be creative about new forms of international autistic collaboration. Oh, yeah, sure. I one of the things that you will also enjoy a lot is that out of the speech and language therapy community in South Africa, but now also in Aotearoa, because the South African, one of the South Africans has moved to there, there is a strong decolonization movement that has started within that community. And I've attended some, I've actually been on panels with the guys uh, um, for some years, and then we you know, when I saw what they, they were into de decolonization, I kept in touch, attended some of the, the online things. And it was so refreshing, good grief, to be led um, by these uh, people. Uh, the, you know, main guy who, who convenes it is an Indian South African moved to Aotearoa, who I think is also queer. So, um, and they also talk about the silos, which you mentioned earlier being dissolved and pulling in knowledge from other disciplines, not just from other academic disciplines, but just from other types of thinking, just from the, the whole of intersectional literature, which actually is an academic discipline as well, but it comes from law. So it doesn't come from a therapy pro profession. Um, and then also just in, in indigenous conversations. And it's very inspiring, you know, even if you are a white person who, has felt threatened by <laughs> the empowerment of yeah. uh, people who are not you. you. You've got to be inspired by what this type of movement will give you as well. You know, you, you actually got to drop, drop your, there's, there's benefit for even for yeah. you um, in there, even if you really wanted to hold on to it. Tanya, you know? we've got uh, Zoe Reed here in the audience, um, who I think has, if I understand this correctly, from the US, uh, she would like to, to make a comment. So I invite her to, to comment directly. Let's see what she has to, to add to, to this discussion here. Hi, Tanya, how are you? Hi, Zoe, thank you for Hi. being here. So yeah, I am in the United States, but as you can hear, I'm English. Um, my accent confuses everybody when I pick up the phone here. So it's been a great panel today and I have lots of um, different points that I could make and maybe we can discuss that on another panel um, on another day but you speaking about cultural differences that we could you know kind of put together to try and make change um, as far as the whole behavioralism complex um, I work particularly 
as some of you might know, in the areas of education and school, schooling and facilities, um, and in the use of restraint and seclusion and trying to get legislation and guidance globally to change um, what children are being subjected to. Um, what I'm seeing a trend is now happening globally is that people are now starting to be awarded neurodiversity awards um, by groups which, um, on my research, I can't see that they've actually got anybody neurodivergent that's on their board or part of their executive structure. And so, therefore, when you speak about how can we culturally change things, Tanya spoke earlier to Alex into, in regards to how there might well be fractions within the communities um, across the disabled community in their ethos or their approach in how we should tackle um, the abolition of ABA or other behavioralism. I wonder if um, something culturally assertive that we could do is join together and instead of having neuronormative, which is the new term I will be using, professionals awarding neurodiversity awards to groups, which way they then go around and saying, we're neurodivergent approved. And it's actually the neurodivergent and disability community who are giving those awards. And if that can be done, does that then make the institutions and the academics say, well, actually, we'd like a genuine <laughs> neurodiversity disability award from the community themselves rather than a foundation who calls themselves, we could make it up, you know, the most amazing autism charity in the world. And instead of them um, giving us an award for being neurodivergent friendly, the actual community globally, a group of different organizations which are neurodivergent and disability led from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, America, from all different spheres, looking at culturally where changes need to be made come together and start saying, you know, this is a university that actually is engaging with different, you know, different people with different disabilities and they are providing research. And we would say that this is somebody, this is an organization that culturally is making changes. And um, would a movement like that help um, where everyone does kind of come together and the community itself actually award the people that should be being awarded rather than the neuronormative people deciding that, you know, a school in Yorkshire is in England, say, is neurodivergent worthy. Um, it's starting to become a bit of a trend. I, I find that <laughs> quite worrying <laughs> that, that it's not actually yes. the community. Yeah. that should be doing it and and is that something that maybe we should all kind of collaboratively work on and then uh, maybe that kind of highlights to people hang on a second it's actually the community who are acknowledging us here we yeah. want to be getting this type of award from the global disability community yes and well then it opens the door for us for addressing all of these structures that we you know find so problematic yeah and you're spot on, uh, Zoe there. I am fully with you and supportive of all of this. And we can build on work that we've done, been doing for the last few years. Very hard work um, that we are, we've been trying to get established in the healthcare sector, which is very, very slow moving at glacial speeds. So I think the glaciers mm -hmm. in Antarctica are moving much faster. Um, we've, I've always been looking for leverage points, big leverage points where we can affect change. And um, for, and in order to improve the supports for autistic adults, many of whom have to somehow uh, find, establish a livelihood in, in these oppressive systems. And we are not all, well suited, well, I think most of us are not well suited to operate in these hyper uh, competitive, hyper normative institutions and corporations. So we've tried to come up with a useful service to support autistic adults in the workplace in terms of employee well being. And we've approached that from an 
intersectional perspective, because obviously not only autistic people are at the receiving end of discrimination in the workplace, right? Um, and so I'll post a link there to what we've been doing. This is in the, um, primarily where the focus on the healthcare sector, because there the workplace, the culture in the sector is toxic. Um, and there's no shortage of autistic and otherwise neurodivergent healthcare professionals who many of whom don't ever dare to openly identify as such because it would kill their careers. Um, what you'll see there, I mean, you, you can, there's a, I, I don't want to go into details here, but anyone who's interested, there's um, uh, a user guide that in explains in depth how this works. This is all about community powered, independent oversight of psychological and cultural safety in the workplace by the people who are supposed to be supported and included. And, and this of course, in this case includes, you know, autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people. So it's exactly, I think what you're talking about there with these types of awards. Now the, yes, we've done a lot of work there. The really alarming thing is that there's a huge amount of grassroots support we're getting from this for this, both from the autistic community and even yeah, from other, you know, disabled people. I mean, via the Design Justice Network, I know this, there's people are really excited about this. But so far, I mean, we are with the Autistic Collaboration Trust, we don't have any funding. So we're entirely volunteer driven. There's no, yeah we don't know how to scale this or we don't have the means to scale this. And uh, we've tried to get this into organizations where organizations basically uh, pay us for um, administering, you know, anonymous surveys and administering peer support of uh, marginalized uh, people giving employees access to peer support outside their organization. and this whole idea of independent community part supervision, I can tell you this doesn't go down well with established institutions, neither in healthcare nor anywhere else. So we've hardly been able to get this into any organization. And this has been a quite shocking and alarming realization for me. I mean, this gives me has given me a visceral sense of the level of extreme cultural inertia that exists out there. So. I'm extremely skeptical when it comes to reforming established institutions. We live in, yeah, the, we live in a very toxic society with toxic institutions and it's, yeah, it's depressing. Um, we have the service design, we can build on these things and I welcome international autistic collaboration around this. We can extend this concept beyond cultural and psychological safety in the workplace. Uh, I just fear this is enormously hard work and it requires many of us, it will require hundreds and thousands of us to collaborate in order to make change. I think what I find most offensive and, and presently um, a lot of my time is being focused on what's happening in the UK is that um, organizations who are working in the PBS remit, which again is part of the behavioral complex, um, are the ones that are awarding schools with neurodiversity awards and claiming them as neurodivergent friendly. And therefore any organization which is profiting from and proliferating the use of behavioralism, I do not believe should be handing out neurodiversity awards. I just, I feel that that is completely contra uh, <laughs> to, to what to what it is that, that should be happening. I feel that it should be on a, the disability community and the neurodivergent community should be saying, this is a school system or this is a school approach that is great. Um, and that people who are engaged in the behavioral complex should not be awarding other people within the behavioral complex as being worthy of neurodiversity awards. I, 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 I can't see how that works. I feel that that is something as the autistic community, 
um, the disabled community, that they themselves should be the ones who are handing out neurodiversity awards, not the people who are profiting and proliferating behavioralism and ABA, PBS, PBIS, um, or any other version of it. It's, it's happening in the USA as well. It's actually happening all over. You know, as soon as something becomes a bit of a buzzword, then people just kind of latch onto it, put it onto a T-shirt, and now they make it theirs as well. It means something completely different. Um, and the, the, I think the epitome of what you're talking about, Zoe, is in a recent paper by Ron Leaf, Justin Leaf, and a couple of other uh, academics. So just to give context of the Leafs, so, uh, Ron Leaf worked with Ivar Lavas and is dedicated books to him and so so they're really hardcore aba guys they they're not even the there, there's some people say you know you should have aba and you should have a speech and you should have other therapies too hypotherapy or whatever the what the leafs say is you shouldn't have any other therapies except for aba you should have maximum hours of, of aba as much as a person needs whatever that they define that person needs and if you are going to have any other therapies it must be aba grounded um a, so if you're going to have speech therapy, it must be ABA, so speech therapy, OT must be ABA. And so, so they, in their, one of their recent papers, and they've actually put out about three papers in recent months, but one of them was, they addressed a lot of issues of the so-called neurodiversity movement. And the, in it, they say, so these hardcore guys, and they also talk, I mean, they're the same guys who talk about punishment may be effective. Um, they, they say they're pro-neurodiversity. Right, so does this word mean anything anymore? <laughs> That's why I'm just going like, okay, whatever. Everybody's just hitting this around like it's a ball on a court which has no rules anymore. You yeah. just, everybody, neurodiversity, this and that. If, even the hardcore ABA guys are calling themselves neuro, they believe in neurodiversity nowadays. Let me just go back to, and this links to what Zoe said, let's just go back to comment note seven of 2018 of the CRPD, in which it talks about representation of disabled people. Then you don't have to even worry what, what neurodiversity means. Um, is your organization, which is co-opting this term, is it representative or has the award been representative or whatever of the actual people with this disability? Because they're the ones who use this word. You know, they're the ones who call themselves neurodivergent. If it is not, then shut up. You know, we've got, a, we've got an actual United Nations publication on, on that particular issue. Just pull that up. And, and the UK actually is an example. The UK has signed and ratified the CRPD. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily being, you know, they're paying lip service to it in a lot of places. And that's what, as Karen earlier on pointed out, there's inspections that are going around now. And people are kind of feeling disillusioned because, you know, since it was signed by many countries since uh, 2007, has it really had an effect? If we as disabled people do not promote the CRPD, do not hammer on the CRPD, do not praise the CRPD, and do not constantly expect people to comply with the CRPD, then do not expect non-disabled people to do so either. It really yeah. is up to us to drive this. Yes, thank you. And I'm conscious we are going over time as this is so common um, within artistic conversations. Um, I would like to um, yeah, thank everyone, all the panelists who've been able to come together on this short notice um, and um, yeah, invite everyone for ongoing artistic collaboration on this important topic. Um, I'll um, yeah post accordingly on on the web a page. I think uh, this can become uh, a theme in, in a project, an artistic collaboration project in its own right, uh, and it can be linked to Alex's uh, documentary and into other uh, important initiatives uh, within our uh, autistic communities in various countries. I would like to. Uh, if possible, hand the last word to uh, Karen Moriyuki in Kenya uh, to just uh, get your uh, final perspective. I mean, what are you taking out of this panel discussion and where do you see the potential going forward for your local context? What I would pretty say is that uh, <laughs> there is need of uh, ensuring that our voices are heard 
and that um, we must first and foremost listen to uh, what we are trying to tell you is what you're doing is not okay and a vast majority of autistic people don't support it it violates uh, the human rights uh, international human rights uh, laws that Kenya has signed into law and and I can tell you um, there's a there's a UN convention on the rights of the child which is also another human rights body that Kenya is also a signatory to um, and uh, and one of the things is uh, that I really want and, 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 and I can take out from this uh, panel discussion is that our voices matter. And wherever you see something uh, that is just going off or whatever, speak out, call it out, use the CRPG as your, as your tool. The, we ha have been saying this over and over that the UN CRPD must be adhered to fully. So we have to use the CRPD to effect change and to find out whether or not it, if any country is a signatory but does not follow through with the full uh, effect uh, implementation of the CRPG, then we have to do monitoring mechanisms. And, 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 a lot, and then the last thing I want to mention is capacity building. It has to be, uh, it, which is a very important thing that we need to uh, now focus on capacity building in ensuring that if we are to ban ABA globally now, we have to ensure that we have to build capacity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Karen. This is much, much appreciated. And thanks again to everyone who has participated. Um, this uh, panel here is being recorded. It will be posted on our uh, YouTube channel and link linked into uh, the, the webpage uh, for this uh, wonderful theme that uh, Bruce has initiated. And let's support him in his uh, local efforts there at uh, MSU. Uh, in the US, I think if he can make progress there, that's a huge, uh, I think that will be a huge milestone. And similarly, I think there's a lot that we can do internationally in other countries, perhaps moving at a faster pace uh, in all those places where ABA isn't yet as widely established. And so let's continue our campaign um, for autistic rights. Um, and for, well, banning practices that um, take away human rights, uh, basic human rights from autistic people and many other disabled people and neurodivergent people. And again, thank you very much. I'm, we'll continue uh, panel discussions of this kind internationally. I find them, they're, they're very educational and they are, I think, a great tool to disseminate uh, knowledge and to help us all locally to build uh, strong alliances intersectionally. And to um, so this is how uh, we are tapping into this body of knowledge that we're creating. Locally, we use this to educate the wider public, to educate healthcare professionals, to educate um, parents of autistic children who have not yet really connected with the autistic community and so forth. So thank you all for turning up. It's been a pleasure uh, working and yeah, having these discussions with all of you. I deeply appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you so much. And have a yeah. blessed night, everyone. And thank you, thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.